Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Claudia Burgos. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs and Community Relations at AC Transit. And I will be... Tardes, buenas noches a todos. Francisco, can you mute? Um, thank you. I will be the moderator for this evening's Realign Workshop. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, we do have a number of housekeeping instructions. We're going to start with instructions from our Spanish and Cantonese speaking um, interpreters for those participants that are participating by phone only. So Francisco, now um, let's start with you and you will be followed by Agnes. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos al taller de realineación del AC Transit. Si ha llamado a la línea telefónica del Zoom y necesita hablar en español, por favor, cuelgue y llame a la línea telefónica en español al 844-854-2222. El código de acceso es 121-3095. Gracias. Thank you. 大家好,欢迎来到这个AC Transit最新的这个调整研究会。如果你是拨打了这个节目,并且需要中文的话,请你挂断这个节目并拨打中文电话,8444-0417-接入码是59881。感谢大家今晚是来到这里,我们开始之前呢,是让我们花一点时间来
So again, if you are participating in this meeting on Zoom, uh, you may type in questions anytime during the presentation using the Q&A tool. Raise hands via the Zoom platform will not be called on. Those accessing Zoom on a computer or a smartphone should use the Q&A feature to ask questions. Phone participants in the Spanish and Chinese language phone lines will have an opportunity to ask questions with the assistance of an interpreter when we get to the Q&A portion of the meeting. Uh, Maria, if you can move to the next slide with these same instructions in Spanish, we're gonna hold here for just a few seconds so that the Spanish speaking participants can also see the instructions in their language. And if you can move to the next slide, we have the same instructions for Cantonese speaking participants. Okay, so thank you all for your patience as we work through ensuring that our non-English speaking neighbors can also fully participate in this meeting. For tonight's meeting, we will hear opening remarks from AC Transit's general manager, Michael Hirsch, who will be followed uh, by Michael Eschelman, who will provide an overview of the AC Transit Realign Service Plan scenarios. We will talk about additional ways to get engaged uh, with Diane Castleberry, who will talk about the engagement process. And then we will go on to the Q&A portion of the workshop. Uh, with that, I'm now gonna turn the mic over to AC Transit General Manager, Michael Hirsch. Thank you so much, Claudia. And I wanna thank everyone each of you for joining tonight's meeting to help shape AC Transit's future bus network. We want to make our bus network thrive, and to do that, we must design a nimble network for the future. That is why the Realign plan is fiscally responsible and a comprehensive review of every bus line in our network. As the general manager of AC Transit, I acknowledge that embarking on Realign when there is still uncertainty about our economy and recovery is, is very challenging, but we're confident that this is an important step that AC Transit must take for our riders and our communities. Thank you for staying connected with this project, and we still need your help. That is why we're very happy to see you take the time today to join us for this conversation. In a moment, you'll hear an overview of the Realign project, a high-level review of key proposals, high-level review of key proposals, to our bus network and ways your feedback can help us develop a final implementation plan. So why are we doing this? <clears throat> like all transit agencies, how riders travel on transit has shifted in the wake of the pandemic. The Bay Area has experienced a precipitous drop in ridership, but a segment of AC Transit's ridership has remained robust. That segment are transit dependent riders, 43% of AC transit riders are transit dependent with no access to a car. 75% are people of color, 65% are low income. Despite the dependence on our service by the East Bay's essential workforce, the pandemic created unprecedented losses at our fare box. To keep rolling, AC transit sought and received federal relief funds to keep bus lines moving. Three years have passed. And overall, ridership has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. What's more, pandemic relief dollars are nearly exhausted. AC Transit's overall ridership is slowly climbing back up to 75% of pre-pandemic levels just several weeks ago, a little bit down during the holiday season. Demand patterns have changed since 2019. Demand has dropped in major downtown areas and is up in communities with lower incomes. Ridership is also more diffuse. People are using the system more outside of traditional commute times, including during the midday, later at night, and on weekends for trips to grocery stores, restaurants, for social activities, faith, and recreation. Ultimately, this means AC Transit is facing a budget shortfall, and the budget crisis is much more than a drop in Fairbox dollars. The Fairbox is just one funding stream that we need to operate, as you can see on the pie chart on the screen, we rely on a variety of public funding subsidies to support operations. Although we've tightened our belt fiscally, the good news is that we are expecting to receive state funds that will bridge the funding gap. However, without a substantial and sustainable increase in fare revenues, regional, state, and federal subsidies, AC Transit may be forced to consider service cuts as early as fiscal year 25-26. 
This is the reality that we find ourselves in today. Before moving into the heart of the presentation, I wanted to take a moment to address why AC Transit is both a lifeline service and economic engine in the East Bay. AC Transit is the largest public bus-only transit system in California, providing a lifeline and service to students, low-income individuals, seniors, individuals with disabilities. We operate our network 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the calendar year. We operate bus service across Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Our northern limits include Richmond and stretch to Fremont, even as far south as Milpitas. For more than 20 years, we've outpaced transit agencies around the country towards transitioning to a zero tailpipe emission bus fleet. We now operate 37 zero emission buses on East Bay streets. Another 21 carbon footprint reducing buses are being put through their paces and will soon be deployed for revenue service. 10% of our fleet is forecast to be zero emission by the close of 2024. Our goal is to achieve a 100% zero emission fleet by 2040. We're gonna make that goal. And I'm proud now to turn this over to the other Michael, Michael Eshelman. All right, uh, so sorry. I'm Michael Eshelman, service planning manager. I'm obviously not in IT, um, so I apologize for that. So uh, the, the Realign project is a top to bottom review of every bus line in our network and how we deliver our service. Uh, we're considering where our buses go to and from, and how often buses are running along each route, and what times and days those buses are running. Realign is a plan focused on our service, but obviously there's much more that we're working on as a district. In order to keep this effort focused on service, we're not explicitly addressing the other things that also affect, uh, sorry, can we move to the next slide? We're, we're not explicitly addressing the other things that also affect the customer experience from our shelters, fares, maintenance to digital information for customers. We do know these are important and have heard this from the community and there are separate efforts at AC Transit to address these. The ultimate goal of Realign is to create a network that is more attractive for our riders and better meets their needs. A network that, a network that works is one that gets people where they wanna go, when they wanna go, reflects current travel patterns and is achievable through existing resources. We developed three draft scenarios which reflect feedback we heard in earlier phases. Those are one and two. The guiding principles provided a framework for measuring how well each alternative meets the core values that Realign is committed to. AC Transit, as the general manager has mentioned, has seen significant ridership recovery, and we're now at about 75% of our pre-pandemic ridership. But as you can see, we've seen some interesting trends. Uh, we've seen an aging population with fewer youth and fewer low-income households, as well as fewer zero-vehicle households over the past decade. But really, since the pandemic, what we've seen uh, is that demand has dropped to major downtown areas and is up in communities with lower incomes. And our ridership is a little bit more spread out and people are using the system at different times a day and, to, and for different purposes than they did before the pandemic. We're now in phase three of the Realign project. To date, we've solicited, heard, and incorporated community input on essential transit needs and priorities following two phases of public outreach. The input received to date was key to the development of the scenarios that will be presented later tonight. We'll use the input gathered from you and your communities to refine these draft scenario, these draft service scenarios with the goal of final plan adoption in spring 2024. Our goal is to develop new service standards and roll out robust public outreach and communications campaign for a new service network starting late summer 2024. With the new service go live date of August 2024. So now let's get to the main event, uh, the scenarios proposed for this phase of the project. The draft scenarios each aim to achieve a particular goal. Uh, two of the scenarios reallocate resources that we have today. They're both cost neutral. The first balanced coverage is staying the course. And the second, the frequent service scenario is more, frequent, more frequency with less coverage. We also have an unconstrained vision scenario where the sky is the limit pending future funding and operator availability. The balanced coverage scenario is cost neutral, meaning it's achievable and it's based on existing resources. 
The focus here is to make the network more attractive to riders by improving access to destinations, providing new coverage where demand warrants, simplifying routes for improved reliability and shorter travel time, and better matching fre service frequency to customer demand. The other cost, cost neutral service scenario is the frequency service scenario, which aims to make the network more attractive to riders through frequency enhancements. Under this scenario, local routes will provide weekday service at least every 30 minutes and frequency will be increased on some trunk routes with high demand. This scenario retains most of the uh, access improvements of the balanced coverage scenario, but does eliminate service on the least productive local routes. The last scenario shows what could be possible if more resources were, more resources were available and is a long-term vision for AC Transit's future. This scenario increases both frequency and coverage and restores services suspended during the pandemic. It also recommends the introduction of on-demand microtransit zones where fixed route service expansion is less practical. Local coverage is restored in the balanced coverage scenario, except in areas where demand and equity concerns do not prioritize restoration. So here's some, some of the key line proposals. Uh, we're gonna dig into a few highlights here, but please note there's much more detail on the website at actransit.org slash realign, including profiles of each line, maps and an interactive tool that allows you to make comments on specific lines. Lines 72, 72M and 72R currently run along San Pablo Avenue from downtown Oakland to the city of San Pablo. One of the key things that we've heard is that having three separate lines on this corridor can be confusing. In response, we're proposing to have two routes in San Pablo, line 72 and 72M. The way the service operates today, those riders near a rapid stop can take all three lines and have a bus every six or seven minutes, but those stops only occur every half mile. So the folks at every local only stop only get a bus every 15 minutes. With this proposal, we're planning to run two lines to ensure every stop along the corridor has a bus every seven and a half minutes, and we plan to space the stops a little further apart. This is one of the proposals that we've heard the most about, and the project team is working on, working on the next phase when uh, we'll release the next draft scenario. Line 70 is proposed to improve to run every 30 minutes, and will be rerouted north of Richmond BART, to provide more reliable service. In addition, frequency along cutting will improve to every 15 minutes when combined with another route. Line 71 will run hourly as covered service in the balance scenario. In the balanced coverage scenario, uh, line 74 will maintain its current routing in El Sobrante seven days a week at every 30 minutes. In the frequent scenario, it will only go as far as Contra Costa College to allow for resources to improve line 71 frequency to every 30 minutes. This is one of the, another one of the proposals that we've heard quite a bit about and the project team is working on those trade-offs and solutions uh, for the next scenario that we bring in phase four. Lines L and LA are proposed to be combined into a single line. One of the most significant changes to the system is how lines six and 51 work together. Currently the 51A and B uh, meet each other at Rockridge and customers riding through need to transfer. We're proposing to extend line 51A the whole way along college and terminate it where line six currently ends um, in downtown Berkeley, covering half of the current line 51B. We propose extending line six along University Avenue to Berkeley Amtrak. This will allow for more one seat rides between Berkeley and Oakland. These lines would run every 12 minutes in the balance coverage scenario and every 10 minutes in the frequent scenario. New line 27 uh, replaces current line 79 service along Calusa Avenue. Line 27 is proposed to run every 30 minutes from El Cerrito Plaza BART station along Calusa to downtown Berkeley, Ashby Avenue and Emeryville Amtrak, taking over the Ashby section from current line seven. In addition, line 36 would extend to cover the southern portion of current line 79 between downtown Berkeley and Rockridge Park. Line 52 is proposed to run every 15 minutes between Al Albany Village 
via San Pablo Avenue to Cedar Street and make a loop around UC Berkeley. The proposal is to extend Line 52 straight down Cedar Street to provide direct cross-down service between Albany Village and UC Berkeley campus and the North Shattuck area. This is one of the proposals, again, that we've heard quite a bit about, and the project team is working to identify trade-offs and solutions when we develop the next scenario. Line 29 currently serves Lake Merritt, downtown Oakland, West Oakland, and Emeryville every 20 minutes. We're proposing to reduce its frequency to every 30 minutes and use those resources to extend the line along Alcatraz to provide new service where we don't have it today. This will fill in a cross town gap in this part of the service area. We're proposing to extend line 18 at Montclair with service every 15 minutes and extend line 88 up to Piedmont every 20 minutes. Together, lines 18 and 88 will replace current line 33. Line 65 and 67 provide service to the Berkeley Hills every 40 and 30 minutes, respectively. They'll remain as is in the balance scenario, but in the frequent scenario, they are consolidated and some coverage is lost to free up resources for a system-wide 30-minute standard. This is a pretty significant trade-off, and, and we've heard quite a bit uh, from the communities that these lines serve. And so we're working with the project team to see what the trade-offs are and how um, what, what, what would solutions look like for the next phase. We are also proposing to shorten the loop uh, that line 35, 45 makes through Sobrante Park so that we can operate more reliably while still serving the community and the schools in that area. A combination of speed bumps and narrow streets has made it difficult to operate line 73 through the neighborhood east of Coliseum BART. So we're proposing to move it onto streets that would work better for transit service and allow for more reliable service for riders. Line 61 is a, a new line proposed in the balanced coverage scenario that will serve Maxwell Park, Monta Vista, and Eastmont, restoring portions of line 47, which was suspended during the pandemic. The loop, this new line, however, is not proposed in the frequent service scenario. Line 96 currently connects the Diamond District and 14th Avenue to Alameda Point via Lake Merritt. We're proposing to serve Brooklyn Basin for the first time by adjusting the 96's routing through East Lake. Uh, riders in East Lake can continue to use the Tempo, Line 40, Line 62, Line 14, and the modified Line 18 to access downtown Oakland. In the balance scenario, Lines 28, 34, 35, and 93 will remain largely as they are today. In the frequent service scenario, Line 34 will be discontinued and line 35 will be streamlined to allow for service to be doubled to every 30 minutes. In the frequent service scenario, line 28 will be shortened in Castro Valley and line 93 will be shortened at Hayward Park. Both lines will see service doubled to every 30 minutes. This is one of the proposals that we've heard most about uh, and our project team again is working uh, on solutions for this for the next phase when we release uh, the draft, next draft scenario. In the balance scenario, lines 41 and 56 will remain largely as they are today. In the frequent service scenario, these lines will be consolidated into a single line that will cover as much of the existing lines as possible and service will be doubled to every 30 minutes. Line 10 is proposed to be extended and line 99 is proposed to be discontinued. This will allow for a continuous one seat ride along East 14th and Mission between San Leandro and Union City. The second part of this proposal is line 299, which is proposed as a new line that will cover the southern portion of line 99 south of Union City. Line 200 is proposed to be extended to cover new development in Western Newark, where we do not have service today. Many of the changes in Fremont are focused on creating a simpler network that works better for customers and bus drivers. All lines will also come every 30 minutes or better and weekend service will be added. However, a key trade-off is the proposed elimination of line 215, which will be covered in part by changes to lines 212, 217, and 239, as well as new on-demand transit zone in Warm Springs. 
However, a key trade-off here is a portion of Osgood between Washington and Auto Mall will not have service in these scenarios. Line 232 is proposed to be shortened at Union City BART, and line 216 will be shifted to cover the Mission Boulevard portion of line 232, leaving Niles without AC transit service between Union City BART and Nursery Avenue. In the cost constraints, constrained scenarios, we're proposing to lengthen some lines to allow for increased frequency and to preserve coverage. In addition, we're proposing adding service to out on, Alcatraz and on Alcatraz and parts of Stanford Avenue. Finally, we're providing a consistent one seat ride to Oakland on lines six and 51. The additional frequency in the frequent service scenario is made possible by reducing coverage in lower ridership areas. And now I can pass it to Diane Castleberry. Oops. Thank you, Mike. Um, just one moment. I just lost part of my screen here. Um, so it is essential that we hear input from the community about how these service scenarios affect you. Phase three, which is the phase that we're in right now of engagement, seeks community comment and feedback online, in person, or at local libraries so that your voices can be heard in this very important phase of the planning process. This engagement phase closes next week on December 13th. Um, if you have not shared your comments yet, we would love to hear your feedback on how these proposals discussed today affect you. Please visit the interactive map tool on the Realign page for the AC Transit website to submit input on any or all of the scenarios, or simply email us at realign at actransit.org or call us at one of the phone numbers listed on the screen. We are collecting feedback on the draft service scenarios through December 13th. So please visit our website at actransit.org forward slash realign to stay involved in this final week and share with your friends. On this next slide is a high level visual summary of the types of print and digital communications we are using along with multiple phase three outreach and engagement activities being held throughout our services service area in the East Bay. AC Transit prioritized reaching a broad and diverse audience across the service area, which is shown in the variety of outreach conducted in this period. So what's next? We will be going to the AC Transit Board of Directors uh, to provide an update on initial findings. It will be on hand from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. for an open house event here in the downtown offices where you can talk to staff and submit comments on site. Then on January 24th, 2024, based on the feedback and analysis work in this phase, we will go to the board with a draft preferred plan to set public hearing dates and introduce the draft preliminary service network plan. This kicks off phase four engagement and will continue in March um, to, into March, April, when we expect the AC Transit Board of Directors to adopt a final network plan that will be implemented in August, 2024. Before implementation, there will be a robust education and communications campaign to help our riders navigate the service changes coming. I will now pass it back to our moderator, Claudia Burgos. Thank you, General Manager Hirsch. Thank you, Mike Eshelman, and thank you, Diane Castleberry, for your uh, presentation. Uh, we are now going to transition into our question and answer session. We will start with some of the questions that we have already received through the Q&A channel. Uh, for people that are participating online, uh, just a reminder, click on the Q&A on the screen banner. This tool, depending on your version of Zoom, it may be under more or participants function on the banner at the bottom of your screen. Please type in your questions or comments via the Q&A tool. Uh, for English speaking participants who have called into this meeting uh, via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand and the host will unmute you when it's your turn to ask a question. Uh, for the Spanish and Chinese language speakers that are participating by phone, if you have a question, please press star six one on your phone. Again, that is star six one on your telephone, which will notify your interpreter that you have a question and you will be able to ask your question with the assistance of the interpreter. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Regina to please take down the PowerPoint and I'm going to ask our panelists to please turn on your videos 
so that you all can help answer questions. Uh, if you have not spoken uh, this evening, I'm going to ask uh, those of you that have not yet spoken to introduce yourselves. I'm gonna start with uh, Chris and then we'll move to Robert and to Lawrence. So Chris. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. I'm uh, Chris Andrichak. I'm the Chief Financial Officer uh, for AC Transit. So uh, I'm uh, here to answer any financial related questions that, uh, that you may have. Thanks. Good evening, Robert Darrell Zari. I'm the Director of Service Development and Planning for AC Transit, and I'm happy to answer any uh, larger scale or non real line related planning questions. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lawrence Lewis with Philston Associates. I'm the project manager for the consultant team. And Michelle. Good evening, everyone. Michelle Lanes, Director of Marketing, Communications, and Customer Services at AC Transit. And I'm happy to answer any questions around customer service, marketing, or the communications effort for our real line. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. I think we can all, we should all be able to see all of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Maria, for taking down the PowerPoint. Uh, this first question is about reliability, and I'm gonna uh, give this one to our general manager, Michael Hirsch. So the question is, I would like to please request that there are enough reliable buses to get Berkeley Unified School District kids to school on time. Getting to school is a critical need for our community. My high schoolers are frequently late as the buses seem to run behind an awful lot at critical times. They take the bus on Sacramento to the high school. Thank you. We couldn't agree more with the comment. Uh, it is difficult for us. I, I will tell you that AC Transit currently operates more what's known as supplemental service in the industry, school service. Um, by Federal Transit Administration regulations, we can't operate direct service to schools. We can supplement the service that we have. Uh, it is a very, very critical for AC Transit. So we're definitely, and we we maintain a very close communication with all the school districts, even individual schools. We try to coordinate on bell time. Uh, we take your comment very seriously and the Realign team will definitely be considering supplemental services as, as we develop the scenarios for the board to deliberate over. Thank you, Mike. This next question is gonna to go to Mike Eshelman. It seems it would be so much more efficient. Um, it seems it would be so much more efficient to have some type of smaller on-demand frequent vehicles. Also, the service to the Berkeley Marina seems very inadequate. If you had better notice of when to expect buses in real time, friends and I would take the current route down university much more often. Smaller buses would would be adequate there. I think that's a great question. There's, there's a few things, few things in there. One is we have heard a bit about uh, service to the Berkeley Marina. Um, right now, it's it's offered by the line that runs down University, and in the proposals, we have it coming on Line 12, which is coming north from uh, Fourth and Fourth and Harrison. So that's something that we're looking at uh, in the next round of proposals. Also, we are proposing a microtransit zone in Fremont, uh, so we want to test that out to see how it works, whether it's more efficient, the most effective and efficient way to operate it. We had some experience with Flex before the pandemic and we wanna see where that tool fits within our evolved toolbox and the best way to use it. Um, in general, we, we have a variety of different size buses. What we found typically is the operator is the majority of the cost of operating the bus. The size of the bus itself is not necessarily the main driver of the cost of the bus, um, of the cost of operating the service, but. I think that's that's a critical point in general, um, that making sure that we have the right tools deployed in the right places around the network. And that's something that the Realign effort is is really clued into, especially the, the next round that we bring out uh, in, in January. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this one can be either for you, Mike Eshelman, or for Robert Del Rosario. Um, and the question reads, I was part of a recent city council meeting and the mayor and council members brought up concerns that Berkeley Hills slash North Berkeley would potentially have AC transit coverage dropped. Under which plan would that area be impacted? I can take that one. Yeah, so that um, that is lines uh, 65 and 67 in particular. Um, and, and that is only in the frequent scenario. Um, so that's what we propose in the frequent scenario. 
in part to look at, at what the trade-offs would be. So in that particular scenario, no line in the system would come less often than every 30 minutes. And in order to do that, um, kind of every part of the district had to have some coverage lost on its least productive routes in order to improve cover in, in order to improve frequency on other routes. And so in Berkeley, it was a 65 and 67 in order to make sure that we have higher frequency on other lines where we carry more riders. Um, as I said, we've heard quite a bit um, from the council, from city staff, as well as from the community about this particular proposal. And we're taking a hard look at it for the next round, the next scenario that we bring, bring out to the public. Thanks, Mike. This, is quite, this next question is going to go back to you, Mike Kirsch. What if community members like the changes in both scenarios? How will AC Transit determine the final scenario? Well, thanks for that question. Um, you know, unfortunately, it comes down to resources. We intend to be a thousand percent transparent. We intend to continue the robust community input and ultimately bring the pros and cons of both scenarios to our board of directors for further direction. With that said, I would love to see us drive for the unconstrained. It was mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. We are working uh, with other Bay Area partners. We desperately want to put a ballot measure, most likely on in the 2026 November ballot, for additional operations funding for transit in the Bay Area. So while there are trade-offs between both plans, ultimately I would like us to see the unconstrained plan where we can finally provide adequate service to the entire operating area. I wish I had a better answer, but the reality is particularly post post pandemic, there just are not enough resources to operate as many locations and in the frequency that we would like to do. Ultimately, it becomes a board decision to direct staff. So I encourage uh, continued robust public input, um, make it your opinion known on what scenarios uh, work best for you. Thank you, Mike. This one um, also for Eshelman or Del Rosario. I noticed that no service patterns, not even the unconstrained one, give the Lake Chabot, Marina or Castro Valley Community Park any bus service. Is making expanding green space access a priority for AC Transit? Would you consider improving access to these regional parks? For example, by extending the 35 over the ridge to downtown Castro Valley. Do I, Mike, you wanna, I can take a stab. You want, you wanna do it and I'll fill in any gap. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we know that access to parks uh, via public transit, particularly in urban areas is um, is an important need uh, for communities and it's something that is lacking. Um, AC Transit does try to provide service to um, certain parks, um, Tilden, uh, Redwood, um, and some others. Um, I think the challenge here that we have is, is scarcity of resources, as the general manager had mentioned. And so we're, we'd have to make some difficult trade-offs to figure out if we have the resources to provide services to parks versus having service to say, I don't know, um, any other type of, of destinations that one would need to get to on transit. So um, we'll take this uh, recommendation into, uh, or this uh, question into consideration when we do the refined scenario. But uh, thanks for the, the question, it's a good one. Here's another one that has to do with finances. It was partially answered by our general manager, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway, Chris. Um, how will you, how can the unconstrained vision scenario come to fruition? Thanks for the question. Um, so it as unconstrained, it, it's not, um, the, the service that we would put out is not, you know, covered by the current resources. So we would need to have uh, basically more funding, more operations funding to be able to hire more operators. And uh, possibly purchase more buses and or you know even uh, expand some of our facility space um, to be able to put uh, that service out. So um, the amount of you know funding required kind of depends on the scenario that's constructed and how, you know and, and how much of it we're able to uh, to put out on the street. Uh, before the pandemic, we were uh, sort of bursting at the seams at all of our bus garage facilities. And so since we've reduced service a little bit, that has backed off. But if we are able to get funding to uh, expand and push towards the unconstrained scenario, 
um, we are going to be uh, running into those limits of space and, and number of buses again. So um, it, it kind of depends on what's in the unconstrained scenario and how much funding is available, but it, it is really, it, it's, a, it's a matter of funding and, and uh, operators and people to drive buses. I'd, I'd actually like to expand on that. Um, I think we have time to talk a little bit more about a potential ballot measure and just to explain the challenges and 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 quite a heavy what a heavy lift that is. Uh, I think most of the audience understands that in California it takes sixty six percent plus one vote to pass a revenue measure. At AC Transit, we are absolutely committed that new funding sources be fair, be equitable, and don't put the burden on low-income, disadvantaged communities. Typically, sales tax and bridge tolls uh, have been looked at. Um, we advocate, and the reason I wanted to expand on this question is that I encourage everyone on the call in the meeting to get engaged with Metropolitan Transportation Commission, MTC. Get involved with your elected officials, whether they be transit or city council or county. Um, we believe there there must be an additional revenue source that's equitable, perhaps a, a miles traveled fee or a business uh, income tax or business tax, not a sales tax, not a parcel tax. But I want everyone in the in the call to understand it takes a tremendous supermajority of voters, uh, and it needs to be a measure that is fair and equitable to everyone in the Bay Area and selfishly, particularly for the AC Transit community. Thanks for letting me expand. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> Let's see, this next one's gonna go to Michelle. I'm um, looking a little bit ahead. How will you communicate the service change changes to riders? That's a great question. Um, I think the short answer is robustly. Um, this is a big service change. It's a big change in how we have navigated our service. The lines will change. The line names that people are used to will change. Obviously, the routes they take will change. And we want to be very deliberate and intentional in communicating these changes to our riders in all of our rider segments, whether they are our senior riders, our riders with disabilities, the adult customers, and particularly um, our youth. We wanna make sure that everyone has an opportunity to understand the changes, be able to have enough time to adjust their schedule and, and how they would, you know, in their timing to, to make sure that they can get to the stop on time, that, that the bus, gets them where they need to go on time. And we want to provide that opportunity through a lot of different channels. Obviously our bus is our biggest advertising channel. So a lot of communication and information on the bus, a lot of digital communication, a lot of web, um, web information, but we also want to make sure that folks who don't use those channels often and people who don't speak English as a primary language also receive the same really valuable, this really valuable information. So we're also going to work with our community-based organizations to get the word out. We're going to leverage staff and, and ambassadors at the stops in the community to ensure that, again, folks really have time to understand the changes, absorb them, and and determine how they impact their lives so that they continue to ride EC Transit, which is our number one goal that we want them to still ride and we want this experience to be better than the experience that they have currently. So we're gonna work really hard to make sure they understand. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> this next question goes back to you, Eshelman. Is AC Transit choosing one scenario for all of its lines or will it be choosing the best scenario for each of its lines? I think that's a fantastic question. It's actually the kind of the process we're about to begin on once this public engagement period ends on uh, December 13th with the board meeting. Um, so just a quick plug for that one uh, next Wednesday. Um, so once we've closed the public engagement period, um, the consultant team and AC Transit staff get together and start to look at all the feedback that we've heard, look at all the data that we've collected um, and look at how each line uh, is set up in each proposal. And then we start to make decisions uh, about blending the two scenarios is essentially what we're gonna end up doing. So taking the best from each scenario and then 
adding all that up and seeing if it ends up being over um, what we can afford. And then at that point, what, what we'll do is start to figure out what the trade-offs are to get it into something that we can afford in terms of operators, buses, and funding. So maybe that involves a line coming less often than we thought, um, et cetera. And this, just want to also mention that this also includes a really deliberate effort to improve reliability. So uh, one thing you'll see at the uh, December 13th board meeting is a, a real hard look at what it would take to improve reliability throughout the network. So we also wanna make sure that this next scenario reflects um, adding a significant amount of, of resources to reliability uh, for, for the next proposed scenario. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> uh, General Manager Hirsch, this next one is for you. Especially as you say, operator cost is so high. What about having on-demand operators for much smaller vehicles? And if it's crucial that they be employed full time, what about having them do hybrid jobs, online type desk jobs, uh, et cetera, for part of their duties? Well, I like the question. I like the creative thinking. Um, I would say that we are incredibly proud to work with our unionized uh, employees, operators, mechanics, service employees, supervisors and whatnot. Um, we're also proud that uh, these are living wage jobs where an employee can take care of family uh, and have adequate benefits. So um, we do have a collective bargaining agreement that we, we live and honor. So any new type of service will be negotiated with our, our uh, unions. Um, and we're committed to, to continue to provide living wage jobs. With that said, we're not opposed to uh, perhaps part time that would be subject to negotiations with the union. Um, most importantly, is staying focused on our zero emission fleet. We know that um, every bus that goes out there is is fewer automobiles on the highway. Um, staying focused to, to grow and deploy, get rid of getting rid of diesel buses and deploy zero emission buses is good for our environment. And, and testing, as Mr. Eshelman mentioned, an on-demand type service, you may have heard it of dial ride in our industry uh, with a smaller vehicle, however, still committed to providing fully accessible fleet. There are other operators out there who have partnered with, candidly, uh, transportation network companies, Ubers and Lyft, not every vehicle is accessible. We're, we are committed to what we provide is accessible to every rider, uh, including those that are mobility challenged. So it's, it is a complicated issue. We do want to test it in, in some of the less dense market, but we are committed to operating union service with our union partners. Thank you, Mike. This next, this next question is going to go to Robert. How do you plan to reduce wait times to transfer to connecting buses? Yeah, so with Realign, um, what we're looking at first is making sure that the routes that we want to have uh, passengers connect to um, are routed the right way and also have the ample amount of space for, for buses to stop, um, have your layovers, and folks make a connection. So oftentimes, those are at BART stations. Um, the, the next phase of, of Realign, well, actually the, the fourth phase, once we uh, get an approved alignment um, and network plan, then we actually do the, act, the, the, the actual schedule building uh, for the routes. And it's in that process that uh, we work with our schedulers to make sure that if there are key timings and meets that we want to have between routes, that those are built into the schedules at that point. Um, and that's also something that's an evolving um, exercise that we can do with our scheduling department. And so if there are other timings and meets that we hear about um, that are off or new opportunities for timings and meets, those are things that we can regularly um, adjust in our schedules. Um, but there will be an opportunity for that um, in a later phase of this project before implementation. Thanks, Robert. I'm going to go back to a previous question. I think you just answered it, but I'll just read it um, for whoever asked the question. In the September 2023 board presentation on Realign, the principle of reliability, the goal and metric was, was added buffer in schedules to account for traffic congestion. How much buffer time was added to the schedules to meet the reliability goal? I think you just talked about that, but is there anything else you want to say in response to this question? Yeah, um, when, we, uh, when we go to our board uh, next week with an update, uh, we're going to have a focus on reliability um, improvements. 
um, and the cost and trade-offs of trying to um, implement those reliability improvements. And so that's something that our board, we, we would want our board to, to weigh in on. Um, you know, we're dealing with a with a cost neutral um, environment um, and uh, and plan. And so things like reliability um, do require additional um, running time, which requires additional costs. And so we have to figure out um, where we can fit that in along with everything else that we want to do in this plan. And so there will be more information on that um, coming very shortly. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Diane, this next question is going to be for you in keeping with this theme of what, what's coming up next. When will the final scenario be decided and when will we hear what the changes are going to be? Uh, good question. Um, so we are planning uh, during this time, um, our planning team together with the consulting team are working on distilling all the inputs that we received from the community and all the all the data and they are going to be um, putting forward a single um, preferred um, draft plan that will be going to the board in January 24th of um, next year. And that's when we'll start presenting that and sharing that with the public. And we'll be sharing that with the public through about uh, in February and March. And then we'll be doing some public hearings and then um, hopefully be going to the board um, in early April for a board decision before we implement in August. Thank you, Diane. This next one is more of a statement, but um, I'm gonna give this to uh, our general manager. AC Transit should look at streamlining the Trans Bay network to reduce duplication with BART slash ferry and provide more frequent local service with the same resources. Thoughts on that? Great statement. I don't entirely disagree, and quite frankly, that's part of what's driving Realign is that one of the major markets that for us is that, that, that is significantly collapsed is trans-based service, in particular service into San Francisco. With that said, we re receive rave reviews on the trans-based service that operates in particular to Salesforce Transit Center. We are often the only alternative to get back after BART shuts down late night. That's an example of where we're looking at at off peak, if you will, off what used to be commute service, we're now finding as I as I introduced in my introductory comments that we're we're seeing more night, more weekend, more special event type service. So uh, we uh, obviously want Bart to thrive. We appreciate that Bart takes a significant amount of the ridership. We don't want to abandon our south of market, if you will, and our Salesforce riders that have have grown to depend on us. Um, but the reality is we do not currently have the customers that we did have going into San Francisco. And those are resources through Realign that we're looking to reprioritize. Thanks, Mike. Um, let's stick with this BART theme here. This one's for you, Robert. Um, is the Realign team working with BART to make sure that when service changes happen, riders are still able to transfer to their BART train in the morning and connect back to the bus in the evening? Yeah, we're um, we're closely coordinated with Bart. Um, we have an interagency liaison uh, committee meeting uh, with Bart that meets um, quarterly uh, to discuss issues like this, um, and we have great relationships with their staff, um, um, particularly in their scheduling department. Um, so when there are schedule changes on both sides, um, there is um, very good uh, advance notice notice to each of the agencies to make sure that we can plan accordingly and adjust our schedules. Um, and this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the schedule development phase of this um, plan um, and making sure that when we develop that, uh, when develop those schedules, that they will be coordinated with the with the BART trains, particularly those that um, terminate our BART stations. Thanks, Robert. This next question is for Nichelle, slightly different topic. Is it going to cost more to ride the bus when this real line change happens? No. <laughs> very short answer no um it, it's it's the same it's going to be the same fare that we have currently so we're going to have a better network for the same uh, for the same fares for the riders thanks michelle okay let's see we've got more questions but they're not coming in here on my screen um mike hirsch what are you doing to address your operator shortage Great question, and I'm, I, I should have uh, 
put the plug in in my opening comments, actransit.org slash careers. We are doing everything we can to hire. We've added more classes in our training center. We've implemented a hiring bonus for those employee, those new employees that do uh, sign on and, and graduate to become operators. Um, we are, I am leading a task force so that as we go through the scheduling process, we come up with a schedule that is um, more reliable and um, meets also the needs of the operators, not just the passenger, but the operators, meaning frequent bathroom or more bathroom locations, appropriate layover and recovery time in the schedule. So not only are we doing everything, every job fair, every community event we can go to handing out brochures and explaining the living wage, excellent benefits package that AC Transit has, adding the class uh, capacity, adding a signing bonus, but we're also trying to make the life of an operator better as they, as they go forward and enjoy a long career here. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this next one is for you, Eshelman. Um, maybe a little uh, transit planning 101. How does AC Transit measure customer demand and need for specific routes? Don't get, don't go too in the weeds, okay? <laughs> oh, so should I put the blackboard away? Um, so yeah, the, so just the the quick piece of background is that um, I think now, uh, Michael Hirsch, every single bus in our system has automated uh, passenger counters. So these are little sensors at the door that can measure uh, folks getting on and off the bus. And that's tied to our automatic vehicle locator system. So every single uh, person boarding and alighting or getting off the bus at every single bus stop in the entire network is uh, stamped with a time and a location and um, correlated with bus stops and those sorts of things. So we have information on um, when and where everyone's riding. Um, we, that is, that's kind of a, a high level of demand is just the sheer number. Um, the way we kind of do a little extra level of work on it is we look at productivity, which is we look at the number of passengers riding a specific line or at a specific location. And then we, we compare that to the actual number of hours of service, the level of service being provided there so that we can normalize it. So uh, maybe there are a lot of people riding on a line, but the bus is coming every 10, 10 minutes. How do we compare that to a line that's only coming every 30 minutes? And so we want to make sure that that we we compare those two uh, apples to apples, and and we use productivity to do that. So we're able to you know create maps and look at everything um, on a stop by stop, line by line, and area by area basis for the entire system. Can I can I expand on that though? We we, we also a key component of realign is finding uh, one unserved potential markets, but also connecting to the community and hearing about opportunities, not just community members, but our bus operators as well. We've surveyed our bus operators. We're trying to take maximum input, not just from the existing customer on the existing lines, but what potential uh, new markets, new lines. Uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about it, but Brooklyn Basin is an example is, is in several of the scenarios. Um, we are incredibly proud of the community-based organizations we've partnered with. I believe we're up to 10 or 12, really trying to connect with uh, with a wide cross-section of community members. Yes, we want transit riders, but we also want those potential transit riders that we can win over. So it's not just looking at where a bus goes, what the maximum load point is, what the loads are at eight o'clock in the morning versus four o'clock in the afternoon versus 11 o'clock at night. It's also reaching those stakeholders that can, can the, the question about the Berkeley Marina is one we're looking very, very uh, closely at. Hearing those comments, receiving that, uh, that public input, um, filtering that all down to an eventual recommended plan, sharing that with the community and our board and continuing to encourage this community input. Thank you, Mike. That is music to my ears. Speaking of community partners, here is one for you, Mike Eshelman. This comes to us from uh, one of our partners at Chabot College. Will the Line 60 continue to serve Chabot College in all scenarios? Will the frequent service have the buses come more often? This is very important service to our students. Yeah, we're not proposing any changes to the routing of, of Line 60 serving Chabot College uh, in, in the proposals. So we'll continue to go there. Great, thank you. Uh, this one's gonna go to you, Robert. How are you working with municipalities to consider street conditions in planning routes? Route 34 to the Route 35 runs on widely. 
a narrow street in disrepair in San Leandro, and this is a safety issue. So I'll say a few things about this. Uh, one, as part of this planning process, um, we definitely, we, we, we have a whole team of planners um, and a planning team of, uh, of consultants uh, to assist with us. And we definitely took into consideration um, geometry and, and road conditions when figuring out which roads were um, proper for our buses to travel on. Um, and so that was taken into consideration in our planning process. Um, two, um, we have lots and lots of eyes on the road. Um, in fact, we have 1,100 of them, uh, um, actually with two eyes, that's 2,200 eyes in terms of our bus operators um, who are out there um, every day looking at uh, the service. And we hear from our operators um, a lot um, when there are poor road conditions or turns that they can't make or geometry that just doesn't work or the street's not wide enough. Um, and for the, the, the things such as poor road conditions and potholes, um, those are things that we report back, um, to the local jurisdictions and cities to, 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 to get some action taken on them. Um, and, 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 and many times they are responsive, um, especially times like now where there's lots of, uh, of, uh, rain and other, uh, weather conditions that create, uh, poor roadway conditions. Um, they are out there, um, fixing things for us. Um, so we have multiple fronts where we're able to, um, respond to um, um, poor roadway conditions that our buses operate on. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that we have strong relationships with uh, cities. I mentioned our interagency liaison committee meeting with BART. Um, we also have uh, those meetings with several local jurisdictions, um, including Hayward um, and other relationships with, uh, with our city partners down there at a staff level um, in Central and South County. And so there's lots of opportunities for us to um, to file these types of issues um, and then follow up with them to make sure that they're getting uh, getting addressed. Thanks, Robert. Uh, Mike, this next one is for you. I want my bus line to remain the same as it is. How do I make sure that my route stays the same? Why do you have to change my route if it's working just fine? That's a great question. Um, and that's really one of the things that we're we're trying to work on with this plan. So we're trying to keep things the same that are working well and make changes to things that aren't working um, and to double down on things that are working really well. Um, so one of the one of the key things here is that we've gotten a lot of public input. So I guess be active. Uh, you know, we have a lot of different channels that we've talked about in this in this presentation about ways to engage with the project. I receive every single email that comes through the realign at actransit.org email address. Um, and those go to our project team, they go to our consultant team. Um, and we make sure that we um, uh, discuss all of those and make sure that we're, we're talking really candidly about the trade-offs and what we're hearing. Um, uh, we've also seen some members of the public work through uh, their own community groups and, um, and, and their representatives and their various jurisdictions where they live. Um, we also have uh, feedback through the interactive map that's on actransit.org slash realign. So you can provide specific comments on your specific area um, where, where your specific bus runs and you can let us know that you'd like to keep it. Um, and, and yeah, those are, we, we're, we're trying to take a holistic view of every single proposal of the entire system in the network and making sure that we're making the right decisions to ensure that AC Transit has sustainable ridership and a sustainable uh, future moving forward. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Robert, I'm going to go back to you. This is a question about Transbay. Uh, is the San Mateo Bridge bus service on the table? Transbay service to San Francisco seems increasingly redundant, but there is no easy way to get from Hayward or Castro Valley to San Mateo slash the peninsula. Also, is there any plan to give the Dumbarton Express even a limited kind of seven day service? Those are both considered trans-based services for us. Um, and the general managers uh, spoke a little bit earlier about the hard decisions that we have to make with regards to trans-based service versus uh, local service. And as part of this plan, we made a decision to move forward with trying to enhance with our limited resources, our local service as much as possible. And so things like bringing back line M along San Mateo um, are unfortunately not part of this plan. Um, the, the, the demand actually was was not great prior to the pandemic, um, and so it's hard to justify uh, bringing um, this type of service back. Um, I will say that 
you know, all hope isn't lost. There is a lot of effort right now, I think also as the general manager had mentioned on regional coordination um, and looking at regional connectivity across the entire Bay Area and looking at our bridge crossings and seeing if there are opportunities for uh, better, better connections across all of our bridge crossings, but happening more at a regional level than, than at an AC transit level. So for this immediate term um, plan um, with Realign, um, our focus is on local, uh, local service, um, but I think there's opportunities in the future to look at um, bridge services. Thanks, Robert. This next question is going to go to Lawrence. Lawrence, you've, uh, you haven't gotten any today. Um, so somebody's wondering, how is AC Transit using its consultant for Realign, and what will your role be in the next phase? Sure. So the consultant team includes Kittleson Associates as Prime, but it also includes TMD for service planning, as well as Circle Point and Metro Consulting for community engagement. And so our tasks include uh, starting at the beginning, uh, existing conditions analysis, um, a lot of support around community engagement in terms of establishing partnerships with community-based organizations and supporting outreach events in person, um, as well as technical analysis in developing some of the alternatives and the scenarios that, you're, um, that we're discussing today. As we look ahead to phase four, um, our team will be looking at the feedback that we've received, not only tonight, but through phase three to help the AC Transit team understand how we can develop a single scenario that really incorporates or acknowledges the feedback that we've received, as well as keeps the best aspects of the, the scenarios. So that work will be not only on the technical side in terms of service planning, but also um, more community engagement as part of phase four. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, Mike Eshelman, this next one is for you. It's regarding line 86. <laughs> Which scenario will best improve reliability for line 86 for South Hayward riders? I've noticed that service in South Hayward seems unreliable with buses coming 10 to 15 minutes late and riders often miss transferring to their train at South Hayward Park. The 86 is actually a really important route. Number of key ways, but probably most critically is that it's actually the line our operators use to get to our Hayward garage from Hayward Bart and South Hayward Bart if they're if they're um, using Bart to get to work. Um, so it's really important for us. It's it's the way folks get to work early in the morning and and get home from work after their shift. So um, reliability on that line in particular is extremely important to us. And um, we have noticed that we've had some reliability challenges. We're working on making schedule adjustments pre realign to improve reliability on that service. Um, and in addition, um, you know, the, the 86 uh, could use some additional um, changes associated with Realign. It's not scenario specific. It's not the balance scenario or the frequent scenario. Whatever we propose in the next round for each individual line will also include reliability improvements if they're needed. Mike Hirsch, next one is for you. This is interesting. Has AC Transit ever considered trolley buses instead of battery electric buses for zero emission service on major corridors? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm just going to be blunt and honest. Uh, having started my transit career at San Francisco Muni, partly responsible for the maintenance department for the overhead lines. And, and the short answer is no. Um, and, and you don't get this question often if you're not close to uh, Seattle, Dayton, Ohio, or San Francisco. Um, they are incredibly expensive. The, the overhead line infrastructure is expensive, difficult to maintain, uh, and really limits where a bus can go. Uh, we are much more committed uh, to um, improving the market for renewable green hydrogen and sourcing electricity for battery charges, ch for, for charging battery buses that is a renewable clean energy source. That gives us the ability to run a bus on any line at any time uh, without having to string uh, copper wire all over a community and be limited when that, that copper wire doesn't go where we want to route a bus to, whether that even be permanently or temporarily for a special event or uh, an accident, detour, construction, et cetera. So I love them. I was proud to work on them in San Francisco, but they are not cost effective, and that's why you don't see them throughout the United States. They're everywhere in Europe, but uh, not have not caught on and we do not have the infrastructure or the employees to maintain overhead infrastructure. Thanks, Mike. 
Mike Eshelman, this next one is for you. Will the feedback and ideas that don't make it into the final constrained scenario be used to make the unconstrained plan? Absolutely. And and I guess I should start just a little bit with the unconstrained plan. It, it kind of serves two two things. So it's it's both our vision. It's an unconstrained vision scenario. So it's our vision and, and um, GM Hirsch talked a little bit about that and how it relates to a ballot measure. Um, so it's the vision for the future and what, what we could look like if we had additional resources. It also kind of serves as an a la carte menu that we can pull off of. Um, so we're, we're proposing these constrained uh, scenarios, but as more resources come or as we hire more bus operators, we're able to pull um, uh, specific proposals from the unconstrained scenario into the service network moving forward. <coughs> um, so yeah, if there are things that don't fit in the, const in the constrained scenarios, they can go in the unconstrained scenario. And I do want to note one thing we've really heard quite a bit is that we could be a bit more visionary with the unconstrained scenario. So that's something we're working on as well. Speaking of the unconstrained scenario, here's a related question. Uh, Mike Hirsch, you mentioned that the public can reach out to NTC and the city council. Can you please repeat what should be what people should be communicating to these agencies to help AC Transit with its effort to pass the ballot measure for more funding? Right. What I'm really asking for is a grassroots effort. Um, in the polling that's been done, transit is is scoring fairly low. Uh, homelessness, housing, unhoused is is uh, the hot button for everyone right now. We get that. But we uh, transit advocates really need to. We we AC Transit are are close to 100 back to 140 thousand daily riders. We need all of them to be uh, banging the drum for transit needs to be transit first in the Bay Area, and it needs to be adequately funded. That we do, we will turn out. We will vote yes. So it's not just MTC and and city councils. It's everywhere you can drum up interest for. Hey, public transit is a is a climate change solution. It's a economic driver for our communities. It in particular particular enables disadvantaged communities to to go to jobs, go to school, go to faith, go to medical appointments. We need everybody that supports public transit to tell everyone they can, whether that be, be MTC or their elected officials, to really prioritize getting a public transit measure on the ballot and that we support um, maybe not popular choices, a payroll tax, a miles driven tax, um, something equitable, something that shares the pain but doesn't penalize the uh, low income and disadvantaged. Um, I don't mean to be on a soapbox, but but the bottom line is for everybody that loves transit, we need to be more vocal. The transit needs their place at the table. We need to be on the ballot and we need 66 percent plus one person to vote for it. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Lawrence, this next one is for you. How did AC Transit implement the priority of equitable local service in the balanced coverage and frequent service scenarios? So as part of the development of scenarios, we looked at equity priority communities that were defined by the Metropolitan Transit, Transportation Commission. And so the those communities um, are, have been identified by a variety of indicators. So it could be zero vehicle households, rent burdened, et cetera. And so as we looked at those areas across the service area, we paid special attention to what the changes to service were, um, both in terms of maintaining service or increasing service so that we could um, prioritize um, access and mobility for those areas. Um, as we were looking at that, we also considered destinations um that would be supporting those communities so um, it could be access to food for example um, and looked at the service changes in a way to make sure that we were considering not only the communities themselves in the, the geographic areas but also the destinations that could support those communities thank you lawrence robert do you have any data yet on ridership on line seven since it has been rerouted to Ashby Avenue to, to Emeryville Amtrak? Yes, we uh, just reported some, some data to our Emeryville Interagency Liaison Committee meeting this morning. Um, so uh, post-pandemic line seven before it was expanded to 
Um, Ashby carried about 400 riders a day. Um, now with the expansion to Ashby, um, the ridership has, has taken off. I think the last in October, it's like 3000 daily riders, um, on the route, but let's keep in mind that that's Ashby is a, a big portion of that. Um, but it also travels, um, a, a by campus and then along college Avenue. And so we're probably also taking some riders off of the other routes that travel, in those areas um and but but still i mean the route is is doing quite well so um so definitely a success story on a pilot there thanks robert uh mike eshelman why are you eliminating line 19 and taking the connection between bay farm and park street away with line 21 not you specifically but why end up with yeah, this is a, this is a proposed in our frequent scenario for Alameda, but not in the public scenario. Um, and what we wanted to do in that frequent scenario is bump up frequency where people are riding it most. And I think a little bit of what Rob said is instructive of kind of the one of the goals of the frequent scenario. So when you put a when you put a line in an area with a lot of folks who want to use transit, people are going to use transit. So the idea was put more transit where people want to use transit. Um, and line 19 is the second lowest uh, ridership local line in the system. Um, I think the 215 is the only is the only line that's lower in terms of productivity in the system. So we were looking at it and we also looked and saw that it's um, uh, probably three, four, five blocks away from line 51A on Santa Clara Avenue. So we thought a reasonable trade-off would be to um, improve service on line 51A. Um, and take away service on line 19. Now, what we've heard is a significant amount of feedback from the public, from our riders, um, from the city of Alameda staff and elected officials, as well as from um, housing developments uh, along the what, what's called the Northern Waterfront along Buena Vista Avenue and in Alameda, where those developments um, were, were built in large part with the promise of service along that street. And there's also a direct relationship between uh, those developments and their their participation in our Easy Pass program. Um, so not having the service there um, might might uh, jeopardize their participation in our Easy Pass program, which is kind of one our flag one of our flagship um, fair policy programs uh, for the district. Um, and so that's something we're taking a hard look at for for the next scenario um, to see what the trade offs are would look like if we uh, maintain service on Buena Vista on Line 18. Um, and the other part of the question uh, was Park Street and Line 21. So in the frequent service scenario, the proposal was to extend Line 39, which currently only goes as far south or west, depending on how you look at the map, as, as Fruitvale BART. And that would be the primary, um, right now, Lines 20 and 21, both uh, serve Fruitvale Ave and go into Alameda. Uh, line 39 would pick up all of Fruitvale Ave, run every 15 minutes and run into Alameda to South Shore Center. And line 21 would uh, be eliminated. Line 20 would operate between Bay Farm um, and downtown Oakland via South Shore. Um, and so that was the, the proposal. Um, what we've heard is that um, the folks on Bay Farm and east of Park Street would really like to have a bus that takes them up Park Street um, and into Oakland uh, along Fruitvale. And so that's another key piece of information that we've heard um, and, and that we're going to take a hard look at. Thanks, Mike. Uh, make sure that you stay close to your uh, mic because you, when you were leaning back, you got a little choppy. The next question, though, is for Mike Hirsch. Um, how does AC Transit Realign fit with MTC's Transformation Action Plan, which was released after the pandemic? Does Realign fit with the region's overall goal for seamless transit connections, or is this an AC Transit-specific effort? That's a great question. And, and Realign is specifically uh, AC Transit project ran by AC Transit with, with our consultant support for the AC Transit network. However, um, part of Senate Bill 125 that, that brought some operating help requires key performance indicators and metrics and, 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 and essentially a concrete demonstration of what are you doing to be more efficient? What are you doing to respond to customer needs? And the Realign project is something we're definitely putting forward as an example of what we're doing. Um, we're committed to deliver this, but I don't think this is the end. I think 
transit in the United States, transit in the Bay Area is going to continue to evolve for several years, if not decades. So um, my intention, as long as I'm general manager, is to continue to have robust community input channels and to and to continue to look at how our market is changing post pandemic. Uh, we want to do this. We want to get it right. But that's not an end. It's a it's a continual uh, reiteration, looking at, at what's working, looking at what's underperforming, and using every taxpayer resource to the maximum uh, productive extent possible. So Realign uh, is AC Transit driven and focused. However, was already mentioned, we coordinate schedule changes with, with BART in particular, uh, but we are looking at um, Potentially, as an example, the Amtrak service from from Emeryville, is there an opportunity there for us with with what limited trans-based service we have? Uh, there are community shuttles. I live in San Leandro, and there's a community-based shuttle. We're looking at it. Are there opportunities to coordinate with that? The other thing I would mention is unrelated to Realign, uh, we're very excited about Clipper 2. If, you, if you're not aware, you can put your Clipper card on your smartphone now and pay using your smartphone. Uh, as was already mentioned, we have no fare increases planned. And we think remaining price competitive and, and really trying to market ourselves to be the transportation of choice is important. The other thing coming with Clipper 2 is you'll be able to pay with a credit card. Uh, we think that's particularly important for tourists and folks that are, are visiting for a short period of time. But with open payment, you won't even need to have a Clipper card on your phone. You'll be able to pay with your Visa or MasterCard right on the bus or, or at the fare gate for the rail systems. We're committed to the schedule coordination barrier wide. I'm on the Clipper executive board. We now have the regional network manager position filled and the council and committee up and running. Um, we would like to work with our respective uh, unions so that we can ha all have signups, the same number of schedule signups at the same effective time so that, for example, we just had our service changes take effect this last Sunday. We would like all the service changes for December to take place on the same Sunday all across the Bay Area. That's the type of stuff we're working on. It's not part of Realign, but we're working on it uh, concurrently with our with our Bay Area partners. Long answer. Hope that answered the question. Thank you, Mike. Definitely looking forward to being able to use my credit card. I have stacks of Clipper cards for when family comes from out of town. Um, okay, Robert, this next one is for you. Um, with all of the resources uh, from eliminating the 72R, uh, will those resources be reinvested in the 72 and 72M? And how does eliminating the 72R connect to the plan for bus lanes on San Pablo? Yeah, good questions. Um, so first, the first answer is uh, yes. So right now you have uh, a 72 that operates at 30 minutes, a 72M that operates at 30 minutes, and then a 72 rapid that operates at 12 minutes. Um, under the proposal that we're bringing forward um, with the 72R going away, the 72 would operate at 15 minutes and the 72M would operate at 15 minutes. That's a combined frequency of seven and a half minutes at every single bus stop um, along the San Pablo corridor. Um, right now, you only have that level of, of frequency at the rapid stops for the rapid um, um, services. Um, and, and in addition, um, by having the the two routes um, serve all the stops and have the same frequency, you're able to have um, a balanced uh, spacing of vehicles along the corridor. Um, and so when you're standing at um, at any bus stop along San Pablo Avenue up to the Del Norte BART station, um, a bus will be coming every seven and a half minutes, whereas now the rapid has a different schedule from the local buses and um, and therefore it's not a very even interval. Um, oftentimes the rapid could come to your stop at the same time that a local bus would get there. The one thing I should also add about reinvesting um, the, the service from the rapid into the 72 and 72M is that the 72M at 15 minute frequency also means that that's 15 minute frequency for McDonald Avenue. Um, and that's a corridor that um, should have um, high transit demand. It has the density, um, it has the need. Um, and therefore, we're, we're pretty excited about that aspect of this proposal where we're going to provide 15-minute service through downtown Richmond. And then the second part of the question was uh, San Pablo um, BRT. 
which is a project that is being conducted by the Alameda County Transportation Commission. Um, and that's a, sort of a, a, a mid a mid to long term uh, project to put dedicated lanes on the on um, a segment of San Pablo from downtown Oakland to Emeryville, actually to South Berkeley. Um, so the model that we had worked out, the, the service model that we had worked out with ACTC um, along that segment was um, something, uh, uh, stops that were uh, um, closer together than the rapid stops that we have today. Um, something that hybrid uh, stop spacing or hybrid rapid stop spacing, very similar to the stop spacing that we have on International Boulevard with Tempo. Um, so if you have these uh, two routes that now have the same uh, frequency and they're staggered and they're stopping at the same stops, then we can actually have them um, use the, the 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 bus lanes um, and be evenly spaced and not having to worry about one needing to pass the other if we were to have say two different schedules out there. So so I think if anything the the uh, service um, uh, model that we have in place for San Paulo would actually better lend itself to the transit lanes um, that are proposed for, under ACTC's project. Thank you, Robert. Mike Eshelman, this one's for you. Why are you eliminating service to Elsa Granny Hills on line 74? So similar to a couple other proposals that we've gotten quite a bit of feedback about, um, the, this one is, is only in the frequent service scenario. Um, and really what we were looking at in West Contra Costa, um, Richmond, San Pablo, El Sobrante um, was trying to get all the lines up to 30 minutes in the frequent service scenario. Um, and in order to do that, we had to pull coverage back um, in some places. And what we looked at is line 74, um, kind of east of Contra Costa College into the hills, uh, really didn't have a, a lot of ridership along most of the route. It had ridership uh, at the high school, um, but we also served that high school with some of our supplementary service. So what the thought was, can we use some of these resources here to uh, bring line 71 up to every 30 minutes? Um, and line 71 serves quite a few disadvantaged neighborhoods. And so that was that was one of the key things that we wanted to, to really evaluate that trade-off and and how it would, would land with our riders and with the communities that, that we serve in that area. Thank you, Mike. It is 728, so this is going to be our last question and it's gonna to go to Robert. Um, will Realign bring back line 80 uh, back to 6th Street in Berkeley? Um, that was a reduction of it was eliminated during the pandemic. So we're not planning to bring back that segment of uh, Line 80. Um, we brought back the most productive segments of Line 80 with the Ashby pilots and connecting Ashby to, to Line 7, and um, that's done uh, quite well. Um, but Line 80, um, um, at the onset of the pandemic and even prior to the pandemic, um, the most unproductive segments of that were, uh, unfortunately, through uh, the West Berkeley segment into Albany and El Cerrito. Um, so, so that isn't in our in our plans to bring that back. It's also a trade off question, similar to what Mike Eshelman had mentioned, where where do we best use our scarce resources, and do we use them for coverage service such as Line 80, or serving El Sobrani, or do we try to uh, serve um, density um, and having more frequent routes so we can carry more riders. So it's it's a trade-off question. Um, and, you know, maybe there's no right or wrong answer, but we think that um, investing our services into more frequency um, will, will, will definitely carry more riders for us. Thank you, Robert. So that concludes our Q&A portion of this Realign community meeting. I think we got to pretty much every question, maybe two or three that we didn't get to. So our apologies if we didn't get to your question. Um, in closing, please remember to provide your feedback by December 13th, which is when the public comment period concludes for this phase of the project. Uh, thank you, Maria, for bringing up this last slide. There are multiple ways that you can share your comments. You can scan the QR code that you see here. You can visit our project website, actransit.org forward slash realign. You can call us. We have phone lines available in, in English, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Um, you can visit one of the 20 participating libraries that are hosting our route profile books with line-by-line -line proposals on each of the scenarios. You have comment cards there uh, where you could submit your comments. Those libraries are listed on our website. Um, help us get the word out so that your voices can be heard as we work to shape the future of AC Transit's network. If you have additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to us by email, 
by phone, on our website. Uh, that concludes this evening's meeting. Thank you all for joining. Uh, for those of you that are online, you will be asked to take a brief survey before you leave the meeting. Thank you again for participating and have a great evening, everybody.